All right, so welcome everybody to the Game Dev Roundtable chat here on the Game Wisdom channel, where each month, myself along with our panel, will discuss a topic regarding game design or game development. This will be for the month of March 30th or March 2021, and it's been a very busy and hectic month to say the least. So I unfortunately had a cold last week that kind of knocked me out, and Shark, I think, is not feeling on his A game right now as well. So oh, we'll... yeah, I've I've been sick for the last I don't know month. Oh man. <laughs> mm. Yeah, well, he's a uh, again being sick is no fun to say the least here. Yeah, and I was especially sick the last two days because uh, I had too much sugar intake uh -oh. and uh, my blood pressure spiked. Ugh. Oh man, as I age, sugar sugar is more and more punishing for my system. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm doing well, but my, my father died today of COVID. Uh, yeah, sorry to hear about that. That's terrible news. Yeah, it is. I get Tomo's window nice and organized. Too. There we go. Yeah, so it's been one of those, I guess, uh, horrible times all around. So, at least in a small positive, we'll be talking about something that will be considered a positive, and that is the growing roles and the growing importance of diversity when it comes to game development and how it can impact things and make things better. So, uh, before we get to that, as always, uh, let's do our quick around the table. So, we'll start with myself, we'll go to Tomo, Ramin, and then Shark. So, of course, I am Josh Blaser from Game Wisdom. And I talk about game design and industry topics. I am now up to four books on design written, and my fifth and sixth books are in the stages of being all locked down for free-to-play and CCG design. So, up to you, Tomo. Hey, guys. Uh, my name is Tomo Moriwaki. Um, I've been a game designer for 23-ish years. I always say a different number there because I always forget a little bit. <laughs> um, I am the co-founder of a small dev studio called Hyperkinetic Studios. And my claim to fame is being the creative director on Spider-Man 2 from 2004. Um, my name is Ramin Shafrizad. I am a uh, uh, former neuroscience researcher and a game designer that went back to school for economics and then put it all together to create game neuroeconomics and I'm building games that use uh, incorporate neurometrics and game economics uh, to make games that better meet the needs of humans. And I'm Sharky Shark, also known as Jim Tickersley, uh, seeking the betterment of short video games and, <laughs> and uh, also the CEO of uh, Nexus Games. And uh, currently, I'm my call, my my uh, claim to fame is absolutely nothing, <laughs> but uh, hopefully soon to be my current game, Neon Continue. And you better have that finished before I start writing my book on a free-to-play designer. I'm gonna have to say so many bad things about the game in it. <laughs> and that is pay to win. Mm -hmm. You've already been saying that though. <laughs> uh, so is everyone around. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> But that will be a topic for another day. For our chat tonight, though, we're going to be focusing on talking about diversity when it comes to the game industry. Now, I know for myself, I haven't really had a chance to work in any kind of like company role and things on those lines. I think, Shark, you've been more like independent side as well, correct? Yeah, I've, I've never worked in a studio. You know, I've only formed my own studio, which has been, you know, my bedroom and the bedrooms of the people who work for me. Mm -hmm. So I think for this cast, I think Tomo and Rami will be kind of taking the lead as both of you have obviously have had studio experience, and especially working with a variety and a diverse group of people. So I guess the first question then, and this can be either one of you can start the answer for this one. I guess... Given, like, the amount of time that both of you have spent in the industry, I guess, has things, or have things improved at all? Because we've seen people say all kinds of things online about how, you know, diversity is bad, diversity is really good, you know, diversity is going to, you know, lead to better projects. And again, the game industry has, is famously known for being very rapid in terms of developing new practices and new standards. 
But this is something that I think that it still is very much in the early days. So uh, either one of you want to start, uh, feel free. Uh, sure. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I've had a lot of experience uh, on lots of big teams and since uh, 97. And so I've really had a, a, a chance to see the kind of, I mean, it, it feels like a slow transition to my two decades uh, uh, um, as seen from my perspective. But uh, I think in the grand scheme of things, the change has been really rapid. Um, uh, you know, I think just from the perspective of uh, women uh, working on the teams that I was on, uh, I saw a pretty significant shift over time. And um, I feel like, you know, as you said, how the industry is very rapid, it also means then rapid changes in the team compositions. It means rapid changes in the audience. And um, I think one of the most important trajectories is like heavily uh, boosted by um, kind of the uh, the Facebook games and mobile games explosion, uh, you know, from like in, starting around maybe let's say 2007, um, that the audience for games when I started was small and mm -hmm. sort of North America focused in a way and console focused. Um, and in a lot of ways, you know, the people making the games were making it for their own demographic. And then we then and we and the people that were making the games were coming out of the demographic that was playing them. And it was um, small and and it wasn't being uh, observed too closely by re the rest of society. Um, but you can't you can't help it. Once everybody plays games, now you need to understand everybody. And so uh, you very rapidly saw a little bit of culture clash as we mm -hmm. as we kind of expanded um, both the user base and the uh, and those who are developing games. I'll, I'll start with that one. <laughs> okay. I, I would say that despite the population, uh, despite the the increasing diversity of our consumer base, uh, I've not really seen a, a significant change in the diversity of the people making computer games. Mm -hmm. um, there's a there's a huge lag there. Uh, I think that there's even not even a clear understanding that the uh, diversity of the team can help improve the bottom line by better uh, by making products that better fit the target demographic. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, you're seeing an increase in the number of companies that are openly being sued because of uh, diversity or uh, harassment issues. Um, but I would also point out that for every company that that you know of that's being sued, there's hundred somewhere between a hundred and a thousand companies that are being sued, and then there's a a settlement and then a non-disclosure agreement and then you never hear about those types of issues mm -hmm. um so i i think uh i think that there's there's more demand for diversity and that's probably resulting in more quiet litigation but it, but but the more just like in the in the you know in the the movie industry the more that that results in uh non-disclosure agreements the that doesn't really mean anything's going to change it just it becomes an increasing cost of doing business in the industry. Yeah, it's interesting though because I feel like um, uh, it, it, if the if the culture of development isn't advancing uh, along with the needs of its audience, that's uh, that's an opportunity, right? That means we can take advantage of our industry's unwillingness to change as quickly as it should, and um, and and reap sort of the cheap benefits of uh of trying to support diversity at least in our own team situations well it's an opportunity for ind independent developers if they mm -hmm. take it uh you're not going to see that type of uh agility in the larger companies mm -hmm. yeah i yeah. totally agree with that yeah and i'm <laughs> uh, i'm glad you mentioned that rami about independent developers because that i think has been one of the major pushes over the last 10 years from the independent scene and by the very fact that you don't have to worry about, you know, company culture or, you know, pressure from the outside when you can make whatever kind of game you want. And we have certainly seen just so much variety from independent developers, not just in terms of the games they make, but in terms of, you know, their nationalities, you know, the stories they want to tell. I've spoken to developers from... I have a contact I made from Jamaica. I know several developers from India. Um, I know a few from, I think, uh, China or South Korea. 
And the beauty about independent development is that it really has opened up the door to allow everybody to try and get in and make these games. Yeah, I, I think what's, what's important is that the people who work on the games want to work on the games. They want mm-hmm. to be on the in the games industry, and they are qualified to be in the position they're in. Doesn't matter if they're a programmer, artist, or who, whatever position. Just you know, they need to be qualified for such position, or else the game's quality is going to lack because of that. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I have so I think a piece of this puzzle that's really important to me, and it's not the same as the public discourse uh, around diversity, um, is is just a, a, an open mindedness in the in the group's collaborative state. Um, and the more every individual has an open mind to kind of, uh, explore perspectives that they may not have right in this moment, the more likely the group is going to be able to navigate really what amounts to a brutally complex space, uh, as you try to compete with the, all the other products that are, that are constantly spreading up all around us. Uh, honestly, from an, uh, like, just from a mental agility standpoint, the, diversity along every conceivable axis, at least from like my selfish attitude is I want diversity of every conceivable access accessible ac- <laughs> that's every axis <laughs> I would prefer to have diversity <laughs> upon because and I'd like to me to have access to it so that I can take advantage of the of the benefits um, that diversity uh, actually confers to the thought process of the group. Mm-hmm. And oh, go ahead, Rami. You know, I, I see a, a couple of competing things here. I mean, the the, the traditional way that that um, non-white males would be blocked from access to studios was the culture test, mm-hmm. and the culture test is a way of seeing: uh, Do you fit? Do you look like the people in our studio now? Do you act like the people in our studio now? Uh, and then, and and the culture test is a way of creating homogenous teams. Um, it's, 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 it's a sexy, more politically correct way of saying, uh, yeah, we, we're, we're much more interested in, in whether you have our same personality than what your, your merits are. Mm-hmm. At the same time, I'm seeing the, the pandemic allowing people to work from home. And now it really, um, you shouldn't really need that culture test some more because it, you don't need to get along with everybody at the water cooler. You just need to be able to submit your work product in a timely fashion. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I think that's going to help improve uh, merit-based hires and merit-based retention uh, more than the culture test is used to eliminate the same people. You still do need to get along with each other because working with people that uh, that you don't get along with just does not result in good things happening. But I mean, like, you you don't need to have you know a twenty hour conversation with this person every day kind of thing. You know you you need to get along. You don't need to be best friends. You know what I mean. Mm-hmm. What what I like about the kind of what you're saying there, Sharky, is um, um, it's like there is one axis where diversity perhaps is not necessary, and that is if if we don't need jerks on the team. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> And it's well, wrong. yeah, but if you're, but I mean, if you're in, if you're in the studio every day, you know, and people mm-hmm. say, oh, you know, they're asking you questions like, you know, who are you dating, or you know, mm-hmm. what are you doing after work, or things mm-hmm. like this, and they're judging, they're judging you. But mm-hmm. if you're at home, um, they don't know what you're up to, and they don't really have a, a reason to really ask you. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, it allows that to be. There are many cultures where. It, it's okay to be different as long as you don't talk about it. Mm-hmm. And um, the pandemic works for that because you can have your own life and no need to know how weird you are uh, when you're not in the office because you're not in the office all the time. We're in the office at all because you're, you know, pandemic mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. online. Yeah. And, yeah, and I, th- I, I think this describes kind of the two sides of this coin, right? One is societal. And one is one is functional, mm-hmm. and the societal edge of it is kind of like we know 
in our industry is representative of of kind of a of cultural values that existed in the past. And as we move forward in the timeline, those cultural values are evolving, and we're kind of just we're just figuring it out a lot better. Because I mean, I was pretty ignorant to a lot of these issues growing up. Um, my joke is that I have more white privilege than the average person. Um, um, <laughs> that might be true. <laughs> I mean, well, and a big part of it is just that I never had to worry about stuff, right? In fact, maybe I could call it like my gamer privilege, right? That I I was always in the know. I played all the games. Um, I have no disconnect. I, I I pass very well as a core gamer. And back in the early days, that I, I was proud of that. It was this thing that is like that. That's who I am, and and I I, I fit or I match very well. But on the functional side of things, like you were saying, homogenous groups, they're not the most efficient. They're not the most efficient machinery to solve problems. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah. yeah. And like when, like for myself, I also had that kind of gamer privilege as well, especially when it came to talking about uh, Gamergate back in like 2014, 2015. Like I remember I made a post, you know, decrying it, saying all kinds of bad things about it. And the worst I was someone saying, I am deeply disappointed in you, Josh. Like that was the nastiest <laughs> comment someone said to me about my thoughts on Gamergate. And again, if I was anything else, I think I would have gotten far worse than that. <laughs> and, I find even just that, yeah. you know, it, 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 I mean, I, I've, I've, I've created a new studio with, with two partners so that I don't have to worry about this cultural thing uh, anymore. We're, we're very pro-diversity. Mm-hmm. We're trying really hard to make as diverse a team as possible. Uh, um Everybody is, has, is in aligned with that, which is fantastic. But of the three founders, two are male and one is female, which is already more gender diverse than almost every <laughs> studio on the planet. But, uh, but even so, uh, most of the time when we're talking, it's the two men talking and the, and the woman is, is listening, uh, but, which is not my favorite dynamic. Uh, but she's brilliant. So... I, I go out of my way to uh, to stop the conversation and ask her for feedback or input, uh, because I think if I didn't do that, and I and and I, and I, in, in 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 other studios I've been, this absolutely would not happen if I didn't do it. Uh, I wouldn't get that input, and 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 having that that diverse input uh, can really help uh, me understand how to make my my designs better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I know with my studio, like, you know, I I personally don't care what, you know, race, sex, or, you know, whether you're human or shark or anything, you know, I just, you know, are you able to do the job? Am I able to uh, pay you kind of thing? Are we going to be able to work well together? Are we going to be able to get this thing done? If yes to all, then you're you're good by me, you know. And you know, I I always have this hard time when when multiple people check all those boxes, and it's like, who do I hire? Mm-hmm. And I think that's actually a really good point of something I wanted to bring up. Uh, I think Elgora left a comment near the start here about. Oh wait, somebody decided. Uh, I guess they decided to unsubscribe. I'm not sure if that was a joke or not, but the comment got flagged. Well, we'll see what happens there. <laughs> but uh, Allura left a comment earlier about diversity and, of course, being able to have that merit-based approach. And I think this is one of the things that's... I'm not sure if this is either harder than it sounds or easier than it sounds, especially when it comes to game development. I remember there was, like, this article, or this whole, like, controversy regarding talking about, you know, are men better game designers than women or something along those lines? And it just seemed like one of those very, like, you know, clickbait. Polar, yeah, clickbait posts. And when it comes to game development, like, it is such a, like, again, we've been doing these roundtables for, I think we're almost going on a year now, or we're getting close to it. And... It's the topic that we still don't really have an answer for, like nailing down what is exactly like game development. What does it mean to design a game? And as Shark said, like if you have like five different designers or five different programmers and they can all do your task, 
you know, how do you decide? You just close your eyes and you know, pick from a, a blind list? Uh, it's, it's hard, you know, I, 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 uh, and I don't know if I do the right thing. So I don't even know if I want to talk about it because like, I, I just get, you know, feedback from a lot of people and, you know, you know, talk to them and, you know, try to get down to the nitty gritty kind of thing. And, you know, and, you know, I'm, I have no idea, but, you know, what I, What was I going to say now? <laughs> I lost it. You know, I have, I've only gotten one cold in the last 14 months, and uh, the, the brain fog from feeling sick was um, very noteworthy because it had been so long since I'd been sick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. The brain fog is definitely real with me right now. <laughs> my, my dark sense of humor says that if you, if you get hired with five other people that are just as good at your job as you are, you better start gaslighting on day one. Mm. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, from, it's interesting. There's something we did at Hyperkinetic Studios, where, or at least a sentiment we had, where um, uh, we were recognizing that we were missing people in certain age groups. And mm -hmm. that at least, and this is a, a nice easy analogy or a nice easy structure to talk about because people don't usually get into the weeds or to get they don't get frustrated about conversations uh along these lines but like for example uh as a group perhaps we didn't know crap about snapchat mm -hmm. um and the people that were living it are always going to know more about it than we would when we than we would mm -hmm. so having someone in their early 20s on the team started to seem like a real asset that we're rounding out the knowledge base of our of our of our team, um, and I think that 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 basic structure is true of pretty much all forms of diversity. Uh, you you I think that there it's a terrible mistake to think that to think that where a person comes from and their cultural uh, kind of underpinnings that those aren't relevant features uh, that that have real serious benefits to bring to bear. Uh, you know we we want to make products that appeal to the largest number of people and the potential benefit and, uh, to us in doing so is very significant. And uh, so I've always, I've always found the kind of resistance to diversity as sort of a poorly formulated argument. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I finally did remember what I was going to say before is referring to the females being better game designers. Like, when you think about the, you know, the way the female mind works compared to the way the male mind works, you know, I I could see maybe, you know, females would inherently be better designers because, you know, their mind works, you know, more sort of in that way, in a certain way, because they're more book smart when it comes to a lot of things. But... Also, I could also see it going the other way kind of thing at the same time. So, you know, it's, it's weird. But, you know, I, I don't know if I've seen really all that many female game designers. So, you know, maybe they're not or maybe they're not interested in that or what. Or maybe I'm just not seeing them. But I generally don't see female game designers. I, I, see, I see a lot of female artists, though. Seeing a few female programmers, but I I really don't want to touch the argument of whether one gender is better than <laughs> another gender, or whether one race is better than another race, or whether mm -hmm. one generation is better than another generation. But I think what's really valuable is including all the above on your, not only in your studio, but somewhere on, in your design pipeline, uh, because I'm going to have a very different perspective than someone who is of a different generation and a different race and a different uh, um, uh, gender than, than, than I am. And, and having all those varied inputs means that we can stop a bad idea much earlier than if, if we didn't have that diversity or include some very critical aspects, uh, like what Tomo was saying about you know, understanding the modern nuances of social media, which I, I obviously don't understand. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and without that insight, I could make some grievous errors and not predict uh, the need for some feature that we need. Mm 
Yeah. And <clears throat> excuse me. And I think like to build off also what Tomo said that it is about getting that first hand experience. And ultimately I think but what you said about that diversity is a net positive in any any way that you want to slice it, I think is an important point. That having people of diverse backgrounds, having those different expertise on your staff is a way to improve your game. Because I think, as you said earlier, on I mean, that if it's just one single thought, you know, the whole group thing kind of situation, it usually leads to things becoming very much, you know, stuck in a rut or you're just repeating the same things over and over again. Yeah, and I, I think I think one of the most places to have diversity in, is in your playtesters. You know, and when I say diversity there, I don't mean just, you know, different races and, you know, sexes and all that other stuff. Um, what I also mean in that is people who love the genre, people who are all right with the genre, people who hate the genre, you know, and, you know, because like having a diversity in there allows them to point out what parts of that design they do not like kind of thing and what parts they absolutely like, you know, which is the the reason why my last game was, you know, a tactical RPG, but it was liked by people who did not like tactical RPGs or turn-based stuff because, you know, people who did not like turn-based and did not like uh, tactical RPGs were included in the testing kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, in the old days, we used to draw testers from our fan base. You know, whoever was on at most active on the forums, we'd send them keys. Um, and that's how we'd fill out the testing for our early MMOs. Uh, but, but then you just get the people who are most likely to understand how your game works already. Uh, it's, it's great to be able to, to see, is a person who really has very little gaming experience, can they even understand how your game works? Uh, because uh, onboarding is so critical. To, to early retention and uh, your onboarding has to be completely different for a person who's uh, has limited gaming experience relative mm -hmm. to somebody who's been gaming hardcore for 10 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think another aspect that uh, I wanted to uh, think elaborate a little bit more on was what Tomo was saying at the start about kind of how a lot of these talks have really kind of blossomed with the rise of mobile games and kind of the growth of this casual market. There, like, if you really want to drive a uh, hardcore gamer nuts, besides, you know, saying about making games more diverse, you can also say, you know, that women make up a huge market of gamers these days. Because that, you know, the whole casual marketing drove a lot of people crazy the last, like, six, seven years. But the mobile scene, I think, has been a very major aspect of showing that there is a market for, you know, beyond the 18 to 30 straight white male demographic. Don't even get me started on the atrocities involved in uh, mobile gaming mm. advertising. Oh, yes. No. Aimless. <laughs> 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 oh, yes. <laughs> you know, you know I, don't, I try not to get into too many, uh, uh, you know, I guess public conversations about the societal issues just because they're such hot topics. Um, although I think... You know, maybe in this idea where we're talking about diversity, I think, um, uh, you know, the resisting of diversity is something, it's its own kind of beast at mm -hmm. play. Something's, there's some amount of coordinated or just, you know, there's some sentiment in the establishment or the status quo that, you know, gets gets uh, the, the hairs on the back of its neck up on end when threatened with change. Um, and I, you know, as I was making my way in the early years, I would have never even considered that that be a, a, a mechanism in what I was doing because we were changing constantly. I felt like all the, like we were chaotic change machines. And so like, at least on the outside, on the surface, I was, I embraced change almost for its own sake. And therefore the idea of diversity in its most kind of, uh, uh, uh essential form was, uh, absolutely an unmitigated positive and then kind of as as you 
kind of sink deeper into because inevitably we are coming from our cultures and we have we have DNA like we have like I don't know thought DNA right that's born from our our, our social environments that means we think the same things that our societies think um, and then you find eventually you found the resistance for me that was really very much kind of the old school console gamer and game developers perspective watching their intolerance of the emergence of facebook games in fact i was a very much an active participant in resisting this and saying all kinds of things that i'm embarrassed that i said about them <laughs> uh, i think the worst thing i once i think the worst thing i said was those people shouldn't be allowed to spend money on these games mm. <laughs> just like in hindsight i'm like wow that's a i mean aside from it being sort of an idiotic thing to say um it's 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 very uh, uh, without realizing it, extremely insulting to their own, uh, you know, a, a person who would choose to do such a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's no, Tomar. that's not a great way to profit from them, by the way. <laughs> Tom, are you self-funded? Um, yeah, yeah, we we yeah, fund yeah. ourselves via so our can, projects. You can say change is good, but from yes. my experience, investors fear change. Mm. Yeah, like... well, the, it's. Our, our 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 society our existence fears change i mean i think it's it's like it's 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 deep seated and it's packed in there and and to dismiss it i think is very dangerous uh, i like that's why I, in so much i like well, one i like this topic but like bringing the deeper elements of that of that conversation to the surface uh, i think at least it's step one towards figuring it out uh, uh, better mhm mm and yeah like to our means point like we've all heard the stories like from like ubisoft in particular with, you know, stuff like, you know, women are hard to animate, so we're not going to have our main character be woman. Uh, that, what was that game about? Remember Me, Remember Us. A game that had female protagonists that the studio, like, the publisher was, like, pushing back against. And they, like, didn't really want that game to come out. And, yeah, it's still, I think, I think, like, for all the good we can say about from the independent space, it's still, like, moving at, like, you know, a slow glacier. Uh, pace when it comes to the AAA markets. I I would just have to point out that at least Ubisoft has recently partnered with Sorare to make uh, possibly the first AAA level blockchain enabled games, which I think is a pretty big change, even if mm -hmm. that change does not speak to any sort of diversity. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it speaks to the diversity between the early adopters and the never adopters. <laughs> <at least. laughs> <laughs> and I think like like for this topic like part of this challenge I think of what Tomo said I think it was either Tomo or I mean I, my head's still in that fog too was something about that they're leaving money on the table and I think that's a, another major point about this that what we've been seeing is that games that do embrace a wider market not just in terms of things from a studio culture but in terms of how they're being marketed, whether it's making it more approachable, making it more accessible, whatever, that these games typically have done really well. Whether it's something as simple as, you know, supporting, like, Xbox's um, accessibility controller, the accessible controller they released. And even games that have had either female protagonists or allow people to create very personalized characters and, you know, all races and genders has, I think, done a lot to kind of, I think, make these games more inviting to people. Now, whether or not that truly translates to sales, I am not a sales guy. I can't give anyone, you know, straight figures on that one. Yeah, you know, I think there might be something specific, too, going on in recent times. You know, um, uh, the new people in any given generation, right, are, are going to counter the thing that the last generation is, it seems like, right, in very much parent-child fashion, it's going to counter what, what bothers them the most. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're also seeing as the, um, as, the, uh, as the new folks roll into their early 20s and they start making games that they're, 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 they're counterculturing their way into creating products for the rest of the 20-somethings and teens. Oh, geez. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pardon me. Um, and that, um, and that, you know, it's neat. It's it's neat to see that because when I was young, you know, I felt like the counterculture was one thing, and then you see it. It kind of like jumps around, sort of. Um, you know, this the, these these issues about diversity, especially. I feel like um, focusing in some ways on 
on gender and orientation. Um, it's been it's been fascinating to watch how fast that moves. And I, you know, I have the I have a 16 and 13 year old daughter, so I get to kind of soak up their perspective. And you know, it's they have they have you know how they make the joke. I think it's even though it's not maybe not 100 percent true that Eskimos have like you know 50 words for for ice or snow or something, and we only have the one. They have so many words for so many things relating to various ships, basically. And by the way, that's that's a that's a term that I, I was able to accommodate, you know, in the course of the last seven years. That ship means relationship. That's that's that that dates me at least to some extent. Yeah, yeah, you threw me for a loop there. I was like, are they into starships? <laughs> your your daughters sound cool. <laughs> and now this cash just reveals how old everybody is. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think I, I know what ship it is. <laughs> that, I think from my perspective, what I was my comment was going to be is that there probably aren't words; they're probably abbreviations. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I had to make a changeover at some point as I aged, where I needed to take a much more conscious assessment of my my default response patterns to various things, and really start picking out the things that I automatically resisted. Um, and not gratify those feelings, rather analyze them and understand. And in the process of doing so, I, I very much found a very concrete pattern. The things that I immediately resisted tended to be the things that I did not understand. Yeah. And they tended to be things that were not present during my earlier years, or at least I was sheltered from or, or, or was otherwise that information or, or exposure was unavailable. Yeah. Um, and that started to paint a very uh, scary picture for me. It's like, oh wait a second, there are there are basically information spaces that I'm I'm unconsciously denying myself from access. And then I then now at that point now I'm like all real scared almost, right? I'm like, I need that information. What I mean, what do you mean that my nature is deciding to chase me away from information, which is like, to me, like, you know, the gold of this universe. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, to honest what I was talking about, yeah, what is counterculture, what's mainstream? Yeah, that's always a tough topic. And yet, yeah, and I agree with you, Tomo, as well. Like, I've had a very sheltered life by, part by choice and part from having physical, physical disabilities with my right leg. So I really did not get exposed to a lot of, you know, what happens in the world. And a lot of my growth has really been over the last 10 years, doing more with Game Wisdom. I think specifically talking to a lot of developers because I, I'm so keyed in the, in the dev, indie dev scene, I have talked to just a very diverse group of developers. I've spoken to, you know, all different races and genders over the last 10 years. And a lot of that, I think, has really opened up my eyes to kind of like what's going on. Especially when it comes to stuff like uh, uh, LGBTQ plus rights. I follow a lot of developers who talk about that and talk about their thoughts and experiences. And it really has opened up my eyes to like kind of like what's going on in that culture and kind of the challenges of what it means to be that way. Yeah, I like those words. I think, I mean, it, there's... Um, you know, it connects this, uh, I want to like describe it in a very fuzzy way and that there's like, there are kind of like conceptual positions that don't leave space to breathe. And then there are those that do. And as time goes on, I'm favoring the ones that have breathing space, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Yeah. I, I, I want to get into something that's a little bit complicated, mm -hmm. but I've been noticing that even in a studio that has a mathematical diversity, uh, what you'll tend to see in the studio is that people that have are members of a particular minority group, whether that's women or neurodiverse people or a particular race, or maybe they're from California, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, they will uh, they will tend to cluster, not only because they can speak more easily to the people that, that understand their language, uh, uh, their cultural language. Uh, but also, I think, for, for defensive purposes. That, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it, if you attack one of them, you attack all of them. Yeah. And so this gives you, like, a herd defense. Um, but then, also, if you're in a, an environment where there's 
potentially something going on that shouldn't be going on and, and one of those people will speak up, then what can happen is that person can be moved out of that group to another part of the company where they have no support, what we call siloed. And uh, this can be threatening to everybody uh, because not only now that person has no, no emotional support, no backup, anything can be done to them. The, they have no defense. But also the other, the, the herd will notice that somebody has been dragged off um, and probably knows why. Uh, so it, it, you can't just look at a studio and, and say, oh, mathematically, they look diverse. Uh, you re it, 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 it can be so much more complex than that. And you have to know what's, you have to really go into the studio and, and uh, to really understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, something connected to that is, is um, uh, what is the sentiment of the leadership, right? That ends up being this kind of really unavoidably essential piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's been one of these that we've saw, like, with some of the allegations, you know, at Blizzard and Riot Games over the last few years in particular. Especially with Riot Games, they have had, like, it seems like every two, three months there's, like, another lawsuit or uh, discrimination uh, thrown at them mm -hmm. yeah, so I think really you got to look at not just the the total spread but what's the leadership team look like mm -hmm. what's the design team look like these are the decision makers in the studio is is it possible you have diversity everywhere else but not yet at the decision making level uh, that's tends to be my experience even in diverse teams that you still don't see diversity at the decision making level yeah and 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 I think the hope is that if if there's if the resistance to diversity can be opened up, that now the that diversity can percolate and it becomes more of an established part of the culture. But it's still it's still I think it's a very a legitimate problem. It's something that is very worthy of continuing to discuss and continuing to bring up as something to be concerned about. Yeah. And I think that's also kind of like really. Um goes back around to what we were saying earlier about independent developers and the fact that again when you're a small team you are the owner of you know your small suit whether it's a you know a one person 10 man team whatever and again that's really a for them that ability to really step up and you know do these very interesting games i know like a kid fox games for instance is a very diverse team i mean they're working on a boyfriend dungeon at the moment and I can just imagine that there's no way in hell, like, a, a team of, you know, aiming at the 18 to 30 straight white male demographic would ever conceive of a game like Boyfriend Dungeon. Or even something like that Dream Daddy game that came out a few years ago. I, I think that's such a great example because not only is that like a, a, an inherent diversity, but it's also like a, a, a melding of genres that you wouldn't expect to meld. Mm -hmm. So, in terms of diversity from like a, a gameplay or from like the actual game design perspective. I have a question that I want to throw to everyone, including the chat while you're watching this live recorded. Before we do that, as a quick time check, it's about 7.35 my time. So we'll aim to wrap up probably in the next like 20 to 25 minutes if that works for everybody. That works for me. Yep. Okay. So the question I want to ask, and I think this may actually kind of even segue into like free-to-play design as well has to do with the growing amount of, I think, calls for greater personalization when it comes to video games. And again, for those of you watching, when we talk about personalization, we're talking about designing the look of your character. So this is not, you know, gameplay or game mechanic related. And I think one thing that I found very interesting, over the, like, the last 10 years, we've really seen, I think, more people be become uh, conscious about, you know, what can what kind of character can I make or I can represent in this space? Because if we talk about games like 20, 30 years ago, it's basically, do you want to be the stubble white male? Do you want to be the supermodel female character? And that's it. And the question that I want to ask everybody is that, do you feel that personalization along these lines, you know, not just going for, you know, age and weight, but, you know, skin, gender, and everything around that, do you think that is becoming more of, like, of a standard feature or a required feature for a lot of these games, just given how 
it seems like it's becoming more and more important for the audience. I think if a game is built, I think some games are not built to be able to handle that kind of system because, you know, like, think about your normal, you know, JRPG or RPG, as I would call it. Anything that is, you know, character focused, like this character has this story kind Mm -hmm. of thing, you're very much limiting, you know, what you can do there as a personalization kind of thing. But, you know, on games that are not specifically have story tied around them kind of thing, then it it doesn't really matter. And you can have, you know, all the personalization you want. But, you know, of course, personalization costs money. Of course, it can also make money depending on your model kind of thing, Mm -hmm. your business model. So, like, you know, like, if, if they have the budget or if that's, you know, meaningful to their design, they should absolutely have it kind of thing. But if, if, if uh, you know, if stuff is tied to, you know, story and stuff like that, you shouldn't be forced in there. I, I, I think I showed with you guys an article that, that uh, a woman was saying that, that after 16 years, Blizzard now allows you to run a black character in world of warcraft yes mm-hmm. and and you know that it doesn't surprise me at all that it took them 16 years to think that that was even important to their to their players uh given that blizzard is almost entirely located at their headquarters in irvine california which is in orange county which is is traditionally a hotbed of white supremacy i mean i'm going to come out and just say it i mean they had kkk people on the city council not that long ago, openly. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's still a very conservative uh, area of California. And um, I'm not saying that everybody there is like that, and it's certainly become a lot more diverse place than it used to be. But um, I, I think I went in to, to Blizzard and just looked at the structure. Mm-hmm. You know, who are the decision makers? Uh, who are, uh, who's the leadership team? Uh, I suspect you wouldn't see a lot of black people there that would think that, you know, it's, oh, we should allow people like us to be represented in the game. Because right now it's probably just, until now, it's been just the people who made the game that were represented in the game. Yeah, in a game like, you know, Blizzard games, I mean, I absolutely, you know, skin color, you know, sex in some cases, you know, because, like, I mean, like, you know, I mean, I, I think they did fairly decent job with uh, Diablo kind of thing. Um, but, like, uh, in Diablo, you know, you had, you know, many different characters, and they were different sexes, races, and and whatnot. But, like, you know, it's, uh, that's, like, I think, one of the better examples on that kind of thing. But, you know, they, you know, you know, they can afford to to make multiple, you know, they can make a male and female sorceress, you know, a male and female, you know, um, of all the classes, you know, and they could easily put in a texture swapper that would allow them to be any race kind of thing. Because, like, it really doesn't matter in a Diablo game, you know, because, like, I mean, all that is just, you know, you know, I guess you'd say decoration on the the face of the game and you know same goes for like world of warcraft you know it's interesting there's uh, you know i've been having some conversations related to this here and there in in the last couple weeks actually and you know i something i realized that i've been doing a lot lately is that if there's something that doesn't really suit my needs or maybe something that i'm not that into um it just doesn't come up in my thought process, I, I just kind of step around it and kind of keep focusing on the things that I kind of care about or like. Um, but you know, we see the pattern, right? That um, uh, some something is out of place and it's bothersome, um, and mm-hmm. and maybe it's bringing up a, an uncomfortable piece of a conversation. And that that really, I feel like, has been the the nature of a lot of this in the early days of my development experience was that 
when an issue related to diversity or gender uh, would come up, um, it, everyone would just get quiet. They're like, oh, I'm not mm -hmm. really comfortable with this. And they would want it to end. Um, and I think it's breaking up that discomfort. It's like, come on, we talk about things we're not comfortable with all the time. We have no idea what we're going to do next week. And mm -hmm. if we don't figure this out, we're going to go crash and burn and everybody's going to lose their job. How comfortable are you with that, right? I mean, we, we talk about own things that are very stressful all the time, but then at kind of a sociological level, uh, mm -hmm. suddenly we become very timid, I guess. And that in the culture of the teams, if you can... If you can eliminate that discomfort, now we can just talk about it. Let's figure out the best way to, like, to what extent is this an issue? How do we make the most of it? And we're making micro decisions about those kinds of things all the time, theoretically. Uh, why is it why is it this this topic suddenly becomes a stopping point? And I think, um, I guess, team leadership can have a big role to play in this. Um, you know, imagine if the boss gets uncomfortable if you talk about a certain topic. We'll say, let's say the boss gets upset if you talk about um, uh, shifting the game from a camera on rails to a free <laughs> camera or something. And you're like, oh, well, well, we don't talk about that. It's a very uncomfortable topic. Um, and then and then someone's going like, so, and then, you know, of course, inevitably, then the designers beneath that person are going to be kind of like chit chatting about that going like, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder why we can't bring up that topic, but it doesn't get fielded. And then the actual problems that might exist in that discomfort don't get addressed and you don't get good results that way mm -hmm. well i mean the I, I hate to come back to irvine but both both blizzard and nc soft have, have tried to recruit me to work in irvine uh recently and in both cases i told them i i, I don't feel safe in irvine and they were like what do you mean it's irvine is completely safe and i'm like <laughs> if i had a studio in compton and I asked you that you said, you know, I want you to work for me, but you have to come to, into Compton every day to go to the studio. Would you feel safe? And they were like, but that's different. And I'm <laughs> like, exactly. Mm. Yeah. And uh, there's a, a topic that I want to bring up. I'm not sure this may be like too polarizing. I'm not sure if, I, if this will be at least too big to discuss. And I just had it, and I may have lost it, too, while we were having this discussion. But, uh, oh, no. Now I'm having it, too. This is what happens when we have uh, consecutive sicknesses <laughs> on the round table. Mm -hmm. uh, while I'm trying to think of this, I guess, any other uh, topics, or any other points anyone wants to make regarding this, while I try to think of the one that I want to come up with. relating to diversity mm -hmm. uh you know i think a little one that obviously comes up quite a bit is um representation right it's related to the to to the to the personalization but the the underlying concept i do think is i've come to realize how how important it is um you know i grew up with comic books big fan mm -hmm. of comic books and i just i'm used to i'm used to seeing what i see and and liking liking it and um I remember what it felt like to to imagine that um, that uh, that that the that the content was being approached in a different way to meet the needs of someone other than myself, let's say, and that mm -hmm. sounded like they're changing the the core identity of the thing that mm -hmm. I like uh, uh, into something new, um, and but as as someone who felt, at least at the time, I mean, I think it's worth noting that maybe I didn't see a whole lot of Asian representation out there growing up, but um, uh, it's not, it, it, I have to see what I didn't see. I need to take that step to appreciate uh, what the people out there who aren't seeing themselves represented in entertainment uh, and in the media around them, what the disadvantages are. And it's very hard to explain because it's in this negative space difficulty right it's you cannot describe what isn't there or at least at least it's fundamentally more difficult right our consciousness is good at mm -hmm. describing the positive shape of an image and it's kind of like our unconscious is good at describing the negative space of the image or something mm -hmm. yep. and i mean we definitely saw a lot of like issues that when it came to like the comic book industry the last 10 years as well with 
trying to be more diverse, not in, not only in terms of the people writing the stories, but again, in terms of how characters are portrayed. Yeah, and oh my god, his comic books or <laughs> superhero like mythology has just benefited greatly from stirring things up at the kind of like sociological level, right? That's like they they generated controversy, and you know, there's a lot of terrible attitudes, perhaps, and we can you know we can be upset about them, but the resultant chaos created buzz and attracted a ton of attention. Mm -hmm. And now it's going every which way. I mean, it seems like it's on a good trajectory, even if, you know, of course, everything is still has a, a, a foot stuck in the past. Mm -hmm. So I just remembered what I wanted to ask. And so we'll see how spicy this gets or, you know, how uh -oh. much it will cause trouble. <laughs> well, tr cause trouble for me because it'll probably be all up in the recorded version. So you guys will not you guys will be as uh, safe from it. But so who, who's ready to cancel Josh? There we go. Exactly. <laughs> oh, no. So one of the biggest points when it comes to diversity, especially when it comes to telling stories, is having somebody who actually experiences it. Whether it's because whether it's a story based on gender, uh, male versus a female perspective, things along those lines, and there's always that argument or there's that discussion about, you know, can a straight white male write a story that's not about a straight white male? Wouldn't it be better to hire somebody of that specific nationality or gender? And this, I think, has always been one of those again very sticking point especially when it comes to any kind of creative medium so i'm not sure if there really is a question of you know if i gave myself too much trouble asking a question but i just want to see what are like the kind of like the thoughts are on that specific point isn't this just basically another version of blackface <laughs> i mean at its essence perhaps uh but i mean i think it i think it also differs like i can write whatever stories I choose to write, right? I'm the author and I'm the master of my output. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit different though, if uh, I uh, am a large company and I have access to tons of resources and I want to serve the needs of a particular demographic. Now, it's in the short, into, right now, you certainly run the risk of being at kind of a PR disadvantage um, by by, by not bringing on people who uh, give the audience confidence that they know them and mm -hmm. represent that uh, audience segment. Um, you know, and of course, it's like I can't even help it. Every one of my perspectives is it seems terribly inefficient if I were running a large company to not be seeking people who uh, already know and, and have spent their whole lives knowing um, and understanding how to create cultural resonance with a particular audience segment. Um, yeah. You know, I think that in some ways saying that um, – uh, and not to resist this. I, honestly, if you can't do better, just you, you try to match, I guess, as a starting point. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it is a little simplistic to say that, you know, we're going to get an Asian writer to write an Asian story. It's mm -hmm. it's really what you're saying underneath it is that you, find, you, you, want, you need to find someone that really, truly understands. And, yeah, it turns out that they're going to tend to be Asian in that case. Um, uh, but I might very well just as be interested in someone who's spent, you know, who has like uh, multiple PhD dissertations on the that the like the ancient cultural history of uh, Mongolia, and it turns out to be some 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 someone who's been who grew up and lives in Ukraine and just visits a bunch, but is like a you know foremost scholar of that period of history. Um, but that said. If it was, if all things being equal right now, you kind of, if let's say inevitably, I, I cannot analyze a person all the way down I, to every little detail about them. I have to do my best and I'm left with uh, uh, the, it seems reasonable to find someone who gives me the most confidence that they understand the work that they're going to do. Well, as, as a writer, you know, you always tend to write from things you've experienced kind of thing but your life experiences you know include those who have been around you kind of thing so in that terms i mean 
you can write about it. But the thing is, is how much can you write about it? Are you, you know, are you, you know, somebody who's, you know, actively, you know, spent a lot of time in, in such a culture kind of thing? Or are you one that's dabbled with it occasionally kind of thing? And it, it's, it's a different thing in any place. But, like, let me ask you this. Who, who here is an elf? Because there are a lot of stories written about elves. And, you know, if, 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 that, if, if writing about a different race is wrong, then, then, then we need to, you know, cancel probably about half of the people that write, you know, uh, you know uh fantasy. fantasy stories you know you know who who here is is a dragon a talking sentient dragon who here is is any number of these races kind of thing but no but i think oh go ahead go sorry you, you need to you need to you know but you also need to be sure that you know if if your story is all about asian culture kind of thing you need to be dang sure you know all about Asian culture kind of thing. Or or if it's all about, you know, any other race, you know, you need to be sure that you know about that race or about that, you know, qualification. You know, maybe maybe you're writing a game about homeless people kind of thing. You better be sure that you are aware of the homeless situation kind of thing. You you need to be immersed in the situation to be able to write about it in a meaningful way. And, you know, that doesn't necessarily directly tie to what you are biologically. But, I mean, what you are biologically, hence, has an effect on what you've experienced and what you've been tied to and and how much knowledge you have of each of these things. What's yeah, interesting I, is I like, think you're, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. But you know, yeah, you're bringing up the same topic I've been struggling to articulate here, but I, I wasn't ready to try to articulate because it's very complex. It's hard to explain. Mm-hmm. But but what you're, but I think what you're saying is like the difference between like phenotype and genotype. Like you know, you could be you could be black and grow up in a white community and be raised white, and mm-hmm. and then you could be tapped to write to be a diverse writer. Uh, to represent, you know, uh, black culture, uh, and and start writing, but what comes out sounds white, because culturally you're white, uh, and you wouldn't even feel comfortable hanging out in Compton or or, or talking to people who grew up in in black culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, so really, it's it's not just about how you look; it's about your actual culture, and uh, it, you can be from a you know look like you're from a culture, but not be. Uh, it's just like, you know, uh, Tomo talking about ship, uh, it, 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 his daughter's culture in his daughter's culture. That means something completely different than it does in my culture. Uh, and I, but I, I wouldn't get that if, if, uh, because I'm from a different culture. Um, so and you can tell the difference when there's a, a, a an independent film made by, uh, you know, a, a very diverse or minority mm-hmm. culture group, you know, that the language they use. Half of it I may not even understand if I wasn't from that culture. Uh, but they don't care because they're not trying to make the movie for my culture. Mm-hmm. They're making it so people from their culture can actually have a movie in their culture that they can understand. Yeah, in the end, it's not, it's not about what you look like or how you were born. It's what you've experienced. Mm-hmm. Like, I am not a good candidate to write anything about Asian culture. A Japanese culture, you know, I, I, I know it as, as an outsider entirely. I, I, I know some amount of Southern California culture from the eighties. <laughs> yeah. Just like I can't write about Middle Eastern culture. Uh, the white people just assume I know everything about Middle Easterners because I have a Middle Eastern name, but I don't, I've never been to the Middle East. Mm-hmm. So how would I know? Well, I feel like those of us in the States just don't understand where your name comes from at all though. <laughs> well now my father's gone i'm the last shokri's on on earth oh man oh heavy but it makes it really easy to get my own gmail account <laughs> well you know yeah yeah right there's there's two sides of this right one is 
whether it is okay and right of course it's okay the author is the author they do what they choose and and, and we don't have to like it and i'm i and and so much i you, know, you have to come to terms as a creator you have to do what you choose and you have to do it in spite of whether or not other people like it sometimes and that's this like important kind of like life experience of uh, of someone who's chosen to commit to to kind of creative endeavors the society's point of view it's 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 not like that attitude doesn't work at the level of oh well you know the uh uh um germany has decided that that uh that that the particular depiction of france is going to be decided by right that that doesn't work at all <laughs> and I, I think as uh on that side of things it's it really ends up being uh, uh, upon the audience to simply accept or not, right? That you vote with your engagement, uh, that I don't like this expression and, and that's okay. Uh, and I don't have to agree with you liking it or not, right? There can be, we, we have different perspectives in that regard. Now, the, but the flip side is, is the side that, again, I'm always so much more interested in this, is how do you optimize the outputs? And optimizing the outputs means you find the person that has it act into their dna with the most amount of nuance because you're going to get better you're going to get better results out of that kind of stuff just as always mm -hmm. uh, it, it, when i watch when i watch I, I grew up in black culture you know, you know grew up in locker rooms and athletics and that was like the token white person in a lot of cases and and when i watch uh, a spike lee film i'm like oh yeah right on when I watch Black Panther, if I close my eyes, I feel like I'm listening to a bunch of white people talking. So um, to me, that just having an all-black cast it doesn't do it for me. I actually want to feel like I'm listening to people that are, have an African-American culture. Uh, and I didn't have that experience when I watched Black Panther. Mm -hmm. I didn't, it didn't matter what they were wearing or how mm -hmm. they looked. It, it, it didn't sound like it. It was all wrong. I I think in that case, though, uh, but Black Panther is trying to convey some sort of like um, uh, synthesis of, of African cultures, which, you know, uh, uh, Black America is, is, isn't the same as that. True. But did you feel like it was you were watching African culture when you saw Black I mean, Panther? I mean, that's the thing is I don't know. <laughs> yeah, true. So I that means you can so pass just about anything for it, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not the, I'm not the discerning audience in that case, and I'm not, like, I am someone who really close to never gets offended, and, mm -hmm. and I think I used to use that feature of myself to say, why are you offended? Yeah. And then when I realized, I'm like, oh crap, uh, I, I, whatever's going on in your head is just not what's going on in mine. I'm okay with what's going on with me, and I, I, I have to be okay with what's going on with you. Instead of, you know, it's just like that statement I made about uh, people spending money in, in, in Farmville. It's mm -hmm. like, wow, that was insensitive. <laughs> yeah, like, again, like, I'm the same way. Like, I am, like, bu I am bulletproof when it comes to, like, people poking holes at me or telling me to get good all the time on streams, which I never do, right, Shark? No, you never get good. <laughs> but, yeah... It, I think a lot of this, I think a lot of this conversation has really come from just getting more diverse names and getting more diverse people out there to create these products and get involved in this game industry. And again, uh, it has been just such an amazing point thanks to the independent scene. But yeah, I know. In the internet. Yep, of course. But I know we are like right at time. So uh, I think it's time for our just like final like wrap go around the table here for any final thoughts so this time we'll start with shark and go in the opposite order so uh shark do you have any final thoughts for our topic for tonight um in the end you know like like when when i do my hiring and everything i don't ask for the sex i don't ask for the race i don't ask where they're from any of that information I, I often find out that information later on, but I don't ask for it because in the end, none of it matters. What matters is that they're able to do the job 
and that they are willing to work for what I'm able to pay them, you know, which is not much, you know. So, I mean, you know, number one, beggars can't be choosers. <laughs> and number two, I, 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 I just don't care, you know. You know, like, you know I'm, I'm, I'm good with being friends and working with anybody who is able to, you know, be friends and work well with me kind of thing, you know. And, uh, yeah. Right. My next means your culture has to be diverse. And that means just because you have a token person, token X person, token Y person, token Z person in your studio, doesn't mean they feel safe expressing their personal culture because you still may have a monoculture. So uh, you need to go out of your way to let them express their diversity. That it, Let them know it's encouraged. Just like the, the, the female partner I have on, uh, in, in my new studio, uh, if I don't hear her speaking up, I stop and say, hey, I really would like your input. Uh, because without that, that safety space, it, it, it just may not happen. All right. Um, yeah, I, uh, to me, diversity is a superpower. It, it is really representative of how to best solve problems like when you are when you find yourself dumped in unknown circum in an unknown kind of information state you you don't figure it out faster by by sticking to the way things have been and uh the way i benefit the way i grow the way i think faster and more effectively is you know really in some ways in a maybe selfish way stealing from the diversity of the world around me and so it's this essential component uh, of how I uh, uh, approach things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the uh, same thing, like echoing that thought, Tomo, that it really has come down to being able to talk to more developers and just see that there are perspectives other than my own out there. And again, I... I think I was like the same way about mobile games as well, like 15, 20 years ago, you know, you know, who the hell are these people? What is going on with these games? Why are they in this industry? And I think, again, so much of my growth has been being able to talk to so many developers and just kind of see what it's like to be in this space and not just in terms of diversity, but in terms of game development as well. Like the only reason that I can talk comfortably about design is that, I speak to people who make the games and I always love it when I get to talk to people from different cultures and just see what it's like in this industry all around the world. But I think that will take us to the end. So uh, to Honest Rogue's comment, yeah, we can come up with another like part two for this. We can certainly... Uh, figure something out and we still don't know what our title will be for next month we usually put these out very quickly so if anyone has any suggestions for next month's topic please let us know in the comments below i'm curious to see what the comments on this video is going to be when this goes up in recorded form i'll be sure to let you guys know of all the you know very happy go lucky comments that i get here <laughs> <laughs> and be plenty of those mm -hmm. and hopefully jack will be able to join us i know he said he was like wrapping up i think teaching for the semester i think in march so hopefully we can get him back on for next month's cast so as always for our final round the table just a quick mention of you know any social media you like to plug projects etc so for myself again if you are new check out the discord and patreon be sure to like subscribe smash whatever kind of buttons you want to hit here and if you are interested in my books on design my third book on roguelike design will be out in early april and then horror sometime later this year i have no idea when but you of course you can follow me on twitter at gw Bicer, and that does it for me so up to tomo uh, yeah, so um, uh, my studio is called Hyperkinetic Studios. We make a game that's uh, in early access on Steam presently, and uh, we stream development three times a week uh, at uh, Twitch TV slash Epic Tavern, where we actually discuss a lot of issues like this, um, but mostly from the perspective of how it affects the characters in the game. And um, our Discord channel at Discord GG slash Epic Tavern, we like 
typing about it or chatting about it. Oh, and you can find me at, at Tomo Moriwaki. That's my Twitter handle that I never, never look at. <laughs> Right. Uh, Ramin? I'm, uh, I've recently uh, formed a studio called Cloudwalker with two partners. Uh, I'm, I'm advanced uh, in the design of a game called Star Garden, which is designed to be hyper-social, to, to bring together a team, almost like a family, to cooperate through progression content of at least two years that we've already designed out. Uh, and uh, in parallel, uh, in cooperation with... Uh, Dr. Paul Zak, and now also uh, uh, Dr. Mike Zaida, uh, we're building a, another game alongside it called Superstar Garden that was going to actually let you use your mind to some extent to talk to the game. And that's going to be like Matrix 0 0.1. So uh, I'm... You know, Sharky, and uh, I have my Discord where um, we definitely talk about game design as well as uh, my games, you know, uh, my team's games, rather. You know, we have our YouTube where, channel where we stream game development uh, as well as, uh, you know, podcasts similar to this one. Um, and uh, we have uh, Twitter, um, Nexus Games INC1, and all the links to everything will be down in the description. All right. So, everyone, that is going to do it for this month's roundtable. If everything goes accordingly, uh, Tomo and I will be having a, one of our chats later this week. And, again, if you have any suggestions for topics going forward, please get in touch. Come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where we're in the art and science of games. Until next time, everybody, have a great night. See ya. Bye. <laughs> Bye, guys.